Good morning, Liberty. So happy that you've joined us today for this time of worship. We will invite you to sing along with us uh, as you watch, as you engage today. Just let the Lord move in your life today through these words. The greatest day in history. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Cross the empty grave, the life eternal you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Yes, he is. He's alive. And oh, happy day, a happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, a happy day. Stay the same. 
friends of liberty we're delighted that you chose to join us in worship today these are difficult times we're living in of course and you're being here and worshiping with us even though it's not traditional but nonetheless you're being in the presence of God in your homes watching and participating in the music uh, and and considering the word of God in your life listen we're just very excited our Lord has not abandoned us and he's with us and greater days are coming, but yet a great day is here. And so we invite you to worship with us, to celebrate the goodness of our Lord, and to call out and cry out to Him. So let this be the day the Lord has made for you in your life. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you and we rejoice, our God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are ever present with your people. And you never turn away from your people. Lord, you are always with us. And we take great comfort in knowing that our God loves us. And he is with us and bringing about that which is good. You, you do a work of redemption, oh God, that's beyond our ability to imagine. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and faithfulness. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray for those that have suffered so as a result of this uh, coronavirus. We ask in Jesus' name. Lord, that you would be with those that are grieving as a result of lost loved ones. So, Father, just do what only you can do. And, Father, those that are uh, ill, we pray, Father, that you would restore them as you would choose, God, because you have an eternal plan. And, again, we acknowledge your goodness. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be with our president and, and our governor and those that are in strategic roles making decisions about the welfare of people all across this country so, and world, in fact. So God, just be with them, we pray. Now, Lord, we ask that you would see to the needs of, of families, especially those we pray for here at Liberty, O oh God, that no peril would come to them, O oh God, and you would keep them safe and protected if you'd be so gracious. Now, Lord, we invite you here in our worship today. We, Lord, invite you, not because you need an invitation, oh God, but because we have an acute need to encounter you. Uh, we always do, but God, in moments like these, Lord, we have a sense of desperation, and we cry out and call out to you, our God, who yet again is so faithful. So, Heavenly Father, do you good work among us. We pray that salvation would come, redemption would come, healing and wholeness, O oh God, comfort and, Lord, edification to your people. Blessed be the name of Jesus who paid the price for our sins. Glory to him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I want you to join with us in singing this song. I just think it's one of the most appropriate songs for what we're going through today as a people. Let it just minister to your heart this morning as you sing and watch these words. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed change to come, knowing the battles won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness, I'm still in your
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Certainly I need him, and I trust you feel the very same. Our God is good, and he's faithful. Now, a couple weeks ago, I began a series of messages entitled Radical. So I'm going to ask if you would to join me by turning to the 18th chapter of Luke. Now, some of you prefer to stay away from anything that's radical. And I understand, especially in times like these, uh, that would be... Uh, pretty natural, of course. And when you hear the word radical attached to Christianity, oftentimes we think about fringe churches that communicate a, a, a hatred, and that's unfortunate. And, and certainly there, there are lunatics that unleash their tear due to their deranged beliefs. But this is not at all what I'm speaking of when it comes to radical fellowship in the Lord Jesus. You see, by radical, I mean that we radically follow our Lord Jesus Christ. We bear our cross and we follow him. He gave his life for us, so we follow him with our entire beings. He had fervor and dedication, and so we follow in that same pattern. Now, in our culture, uh, many think that radical Christians contribute to the problem. And I think that we are not radical enough. Now, what I mean by that is that we need to completely, totally yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus. I mean, we need to completely uh, give our devotion to him, and we need to hold nothing from him. We need to love like he loved. We need to give sacrificially as he gave sacrificially. Jesus set himself aside to consider the desperate needs of others, and so we must follow the same. You see, I use the word radical because our Lord Jesus Christ radically hung on the cross and brought about a radical salvation for our sins. You see, he did not die so that we would be half-hearted or half-committed or uh, half-way uh, in attendance in our church. You see, Jesus is too important for that. Now, all across America, Christians are teaching a lie. You see, by their actions, they are teaching that a person can be radically saved from sin, but not radically changed in their lives. And this certainly is out of character and a terrible witness to the power of the gospel. Now, in our first lesson on radical, in fact, if you did not see that, you can go to our website, uh, lbcfed.org, and get caught up. But we spoke about radical Christians pray about everything without giving up. Now, in today's message, we're going to learn that common Christians trust themselves for their needs, while radical Christians trust the Lord Jesus 
desperately for their needs. Now, there are two stories we're going to consider in today's message. The first story is about one's radical need for mercy. You'll find it in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with chapter 9 through verse 14. So let's begin reading, shall we? Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 9. And he, he being Jesus, also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, there are two characters in the story. The first character is a tax collector. Now, a tax collector was a Jew that worked for Rome. And among Jewish citizenry of the first century, he was considered an absolute despicable human being. Now, today we are rather entertained with the Roman Empire. We enjoy reading books about the Roman Empire, watching movies about the Roman Empire. But I assure you that in the first century, the Roman Empire was utterly wicked. You see, it brutalized thousands of Jews when Rome conquered them. And Rome showed their strength by crucifying hundreds of Jews along public roads. You see, they crushed anyone or anything that challenged their authority. And taxing Jewish citizens was so contemptible that Rome hired a Jew to assess the taxes. Now, a tax collector could levy as much taxes as they could collect as long as Rome received its share. You see, that's why tax collectors were among the most hated members of the Jewish community. I mean, they were political traitors and conspirators and informants. And I mean, they were just like a, a, a beast on steroids. They were just absolutely despised. So the first character in our story is a tax collector, a dreadful, despicable human being as understood by the first century Jew. And the second character was a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees were the good guys of their day. They were exemplary uh, citizens. They were moral in their conduct. They were patriotic in their politics. And they were fervent in their religion. I mean, we would think today that the Pharisees were outstanding churchmen. We would consider them as being the model of what you would hope that Americans would be. Two members, two characters in this story representing a vast uh, different uh, set of uh, behaviors. Now, look if you would at verses 11 through 13. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. You see, Pharisees pray to themselves. They don't pray to God. <laughs> they, they pray to themselves. Have you ever felt like your prayers were just bouncing off the wall. Well, it may be that, in fact, is the case. It was with this Pharisee. Now, let's continue reading. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers and unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays, as it was in Jewish tradition. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, Jesus was not saying that there is one good guy in this story and one bad guy in this story. I assure you that both characters in this story would be what we consider bad guys. The difference being one of the characters knew it. Now, the message here is that religion, even if it is in the format of Christian religiosity, can easily cover up one's unrighteousness. So let's do a bit of a comparison for a moment, and we're going to do that throughout the message. Common Christians are just 
terrible people. Now, I trust that doesn't sound offensive to you, but let me explain what I mean. You see, common Christians are self-absorbed. They're self-righteous. They think they are better than other people. They look down their noses on others. They play the religious game very well. They wear the label of Christian on their lapels, but in their hearts they are detestable in the sight of God. You see, that was represented by this Pharisee. Terrible person. Non-religious people are terrible too. You see, they call Christians hypocrites and they say, well, the people down at the church, they just are interested in judging me. They will often say, well, at least I'm not like them. And what they fail to do is to realize what they're accusing Christians of doing, they're doing themselves. Plus, they're just dirty dog wicked. I guess I want you to understand that in the story for us to understand it and make application both of these characters were terrible in the eyes of God. One wasn't aware of it. The other was very acutely aware. Now look, if you will, at verse 14. I tell you this, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. Speaking here of the tax collector. For everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, Jesus brings the story to a kind of a startling, radical conclusion. Let's first of all talk about the wicked guy. The wicked guy is justified, and the good guy, the Pharisee, he is scoffed and scorned. Now, you say, well, how could that be? Well, Verse 13 gives us a clue to the wicked guy, if you will, the tax collector. He cried out to God and said this, God be merciful to me, the sinner. You see, he understood he was a sinner. He acknowledged he was a sinner. He knew he was unworthy of God's care. You see, he walked in the temple with a sin list a mile long, and he walked out of the temple with a spotless record in the eyes of God. Now, he didn't deserve it, but he received the gift of God's mercy. He cried out in desperation, oh, God, have mercy, and our Lord is good and faithful. So character one, the wicked guy in this story is just. Now, the Pharisee, who represents common Christians and other religionists, he thought he was okay. He thought if he came into the temple, he was doing what was right and good. And if he offered prayer, he thought he was doing what was right and good. And if he um, uh, exercised some good deportment, then he was doing what is right and good. But he wasn't. You see, he's the villain in the story. You see, Jesus was saying in today's standards that sex traffickers and drug pushers and porn stars and murderers and child molesters who cry out to God in desperation for mercy are better off than church members who, who, who are faithful to go to PTA and, and, and who never cheat on their tax returns, but but see no need for God's mercy. You see, they're worse off than the tax collector. I want you to know something that is so essential here. No matter how bad you are, there is radical mercy available to you. If you will come to the Lord Jesus with radical need, depend on him for radical mercy. He has an abundant supply of it. But if you trust in your righteousness, in your goodness, if you look down on wickedness of others, then you're a common Christian. And in the Bible, there really isn't such a thing. You see, sin sends people to hell and so does 
common Christianity because human religion is sinful. Never, my brothers and sisters, never, my friends, overestimate your righteousness. Come to God because you have desperate need. And he has an abundant supply of mercy. Now, story one that we've just considered was a story about a desperate need for mercy. Now, let's move to our second story. And that is a story about a person's radical need for help. So let's read chapter 18 of the Gospel of Luke, and we'll begin with verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Now, Jesus tells another story about a radical need. A man was sitting along the side of the road in Jericho, and he needed help. He was begging. He had an acute, radical need in his life. Now, the Gospel of Matthew tells us that this man's name was Bartimaeus. Now, when Jesus was walking along the roadway to enter Jericho, Word reached Bartimaeus that Jesus, the great miracle worker, was near. And so he begins to cry out, Oh, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, he cries out, right? He's so desperate. I mean, he's crying out, Oh, David, Son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, he was relentless. But the folks nearby began to say, Hush, hush, because Jesus has more important matters to consider than you. Now that's wrong. And I want you to understand this. Jesus has nothing better in his life than to address the needs of desperate people. If you're here today and you just feel desperate and you feel there's all sort of needs that exist in your life, there is nothing that satisfies Jesus any more than stopping and addressing your needs. Now, common Christianity, you see, it's all about giving attention to themselves. You see, they meet together to satisfy their own desires. They program around the church to satisfy their preferences. Their goal is to polish up Phariseeism and so that others in the church would talk like them, look like them, sound like them. And you see, their goal is to make others like them. Phariseeism. If you're not like them, you're not welcome in their churches. But right of Christianity is all about people with desperate needs. You see, their ministry our ministry here at Liberty is all about compassion. It's about people who have desperate needs, who will call out and cry out to God for help. Not only will we respond, but we will share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus. You see, our goal here is to make you a disciple so that you walk like Jesus, you talk like Jesus, you act like Jesus. I mean, that's the goal that we all share here at Liberty. That's radical Christianity. And that's the only kind we find in Scripture. Now look, if you would, at verse 41. 
Jesus asks an inter interesting question. He says, what do you want me to do for you? I find this a bit humorous. I mean, certainly the Son of God knew what this blind, begging, needing man along the road needed. I mean, everyone else knew, right? Everyone knew that this blind man wanted healing. He wanted his sight. You see, there are two things that I think we need to understand from this question. When Jesus offered the question to the desperately needy man, the man responded in word and in deed. Now, here's what I mean. By his words, this is what he said. Lord, I want to regain my sight. I mean, that's obvious and apparent, isn't it? He was a blind man who needed sight. And so the words he expressed was, Lord, I want to receive my sight. But by his actions, he was saying this. Oh, master, I am helpless and hopeless without you. Lord Jesus, you and you alone can change my life, bring new life to me, cause transformation in my life. That's what he was saying. So when Jesus asked the question, what would you want me to do for you? He gave the needy, desperate man an opportunity to express his need for Jesus. You see, neither this man nor anyone else could meet his need. Jesus was the radical need provider. So I'm going to ask you today, how needy are you? How needy are you? I mean, are you so needy that you find yourself crying out and calling out to God? I mean, are you so needy that you have come to the conclusion that you're helpless and hopeless without Jesus? And certainly in times like this, have you come to the point that your answer is not government and it's not in scientists, but it is in the Lord Jesus Christ? I trust you're crying out to God for his help. Now, there are three applications I would like to make this morning regarding the two stories of desperate need. Application number one. Radical need requires radical help from God. See, here's what is so imperative. We can hear stories like we just shared. Uh, they're rather two common stories. Many of you know them. But if we don't apply the lessons to our life, then we are hearers and not doers of the word. So the first application is radical need requires radical help from God. Now, we learned this story, and... Um, the instance with the widow who constantly cried out for help, the tax collector who came to the Lord in prayer humbly, and the blind man who cried out for mercy. You see, what we learn is that we are in a better state with God when we realize our desperate need for him than when we think we've got it all together. You know, we oftentimes we come to church, we just act like we got it all together, right? We put a smile on, we carry our big old reference Bibles under our arms, and we just pretend like everything is fine. Common Christianity relies on self and human resources. You know, in our culture, we pride ourselves in being so intelligent. Um, it's nothing but arrogance, actually. Uh, to a degree, uh, of course, we, we, we choose the best schools for our children because we want them to have the very best best education. Now, we don't say good education. Do we? we never say, I want my child to have a good education. I want my child to have the best education. The best, yep, the best education he, can, he or she can possibly have. You see, we, um, we, we read books and we watch televisions and some are even consumed with, with, with news media and, and, and other sorts of uh, educational uh, forums because we pride ourselves in knowing what's going on and being aware and, and certainly able to have an opinion. Well, I guess what gets me most is that I see so many people uh, demonstrating uh, really an arrogance, a sense of um, 
uh, pride, pride in their intelligence when, when they think they know more about their medical issues than their doctors. And they're, they're quick to say, doctor, you're wrong. This is what I need. I just find that amusing. You see, I wonder if this is why we don't pray more because we just don't see the need. You see, we're comfortable in ourselves. We're we're satisfied with the resources that we have. We're intelligent people. We know there is a pathway to help in our community and we have adequate resources to help provide for our needs. I hope that if the coronavirus pestilence has taught us anything, and that is what we know is not adequate, what we possess is not adequate, our resources are not sufficient, we are desperate in our need for God. You see, that's radical Christianity. You see, radical Christianity says, Lord, you're the solution. You are. And I believe in you. And I believe that you have a desire to help people in need. So I'm going to ask you, how radical are you? I mean, are you radical enough to give Jesus complete control of your life? Are you radical enough to say, Lord, I'm going to put down worry and I'm going to put down frustration and I'm going to put down anger and I'm going to live for you? Are you radical enough that you will put the Lord as the answer to your questions and your solution to your needs? That's radical. Radical need requires radical help. Maybe the reason we're not finding radical help is because we've not expressed radical need because we really don't think we're all that needy. Number two, radical need requires radical mercy from God. Now, I know this sounds rather elementary, but I want you to consider this. Every single one of us listening today and participating in our worship, and even those, of course, beyond, throughout our nation and beyond, everyone needs the mercy of God. And if these stories are clear about any matter, it's clear that everyone is in desperate need for the mercy of God. You know, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Now, common Christianity, or religionists, if you will, basically says, you know, uh, I'm good, and uh, I believe in God, and I think as a result, then I will go to heaven when I die. You see, this is the religion of the Pharisees. And they think and act like salvation is in their hands because I believe in God, I am good, I am a decent human being, so I think I will go to heaven when I die. I think you're catching the drift here, aren't you? There's way too much eyes in those expressions. You see, so many think they can do the Christian thing because they know enough or are good enough, when in fact that's never the case. You see, radical Christianity says we absolutely are dependent on God's mercy. We 100% are in need of the mercy of God. You see, in this story, there are two characters. And I need to ask you, which of the two best represents your life? There are only two characters. And the Lord intended that to be the case. There is the Pharisee, the religionist who was self-righteous, who had no need for God's mercy. And then there was a tax collector who needed the mercy of God. So let me ask you, who do you identify with? You see, all of us are not like the tax collector. All of us are the tax collector. We must come to Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And like, Blind Bartimaeus, lying on the street with no one to offer help and aid. Oh, God, have mercy on me. You see, radical need requires radical mercy. And if we're not experiencing radical mercy, it may be that we're not expressing radical need. It may be that we feel a little bit more like the Pharisee. We're pretty good folks. Third and finally, 
But radical need requires radical righteousness from Jesus. The Pharisee demonstrated self-righteousness. You see, he entered the temple feeling self-righteous. He left the temple praying to himself, as we read, feeling self-righteous. You see, religionists, common Christianity breeds self-righteousness. Now, I want to share this with you and be as clear as I possibly can. Here at Liberty, we make a big deal out of Bible study. I mean, I challenge you, as you have heard me many, many times, uh, asking, have you read your Bible every day this week? And thank the Lord, so many of you say yes, amen, and I'm so delighted. And I believe it's a great praise to the Lord, and that's good. It's good to read the Bible. It's good to come to church and study the Bible. But here's the danger. The danger is that we will believe that because we read or study the Bible, then we are righteous. Now, here at Liberty, we make a big deal out of prayer. In fact, we say prayer is our first ministry. It's absolutely crucial. But here's the danger. The danger is that we would assume that if we pray, then we are righteous. Now, now what happens is we create a cause and effect of relationship. Because I do this, then the effect is then I become righteous. That's the danger. You see... We can attend church and we can pray and we can read the Bible and still be like the Pharisee. We must cry out for God and the Lord Jesus and ask him for his righteousness to be our righteousness. You see, common Christianity is nothing other than works-based salvation. That's Phariseeism. Now, radical Christianity breeds the conviction that we need a radical Savior to give us who are in radical need his righteousness. You see, righteousness comes from Jesus. It was our Lord who died on Calvary. It was our Lord Jesus who gave himself as a substitute for our sins and payment of all of our indiscretions. And he gives us his righteousness. And we are sinners in dire need of the life of the Lord Jesus who would die on Calvary. And then we choose to follow him. Desperate need requires desperate righteousness. And that's not your righteousness. That's his righteousness. Now, some of you need to become radical Christians. And I say that out of a heart of love and affection, not of condemnation. You see, all of us must be radical followers of Jesus. There's only one type of Christianity proposed in the New Testament. And that is a radical form where Jesus died and he called us to bear our cross and follow him. Now let's get personal for a moment. Some of you claim by confession of faith that you have trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, but you have not been baptized. You need to be radically committed to following Jesus, and his word is clear. Baptism is a command. You see, we cannot say with one breath, you are my Lord and then in the next breath say, no, I'm not going to be baptized because the preacher just grabs a hold of him and puts you in the water and you go in dry and you come out wet and everyone witnesses the whole matter and it just is a bit of a humbling thing. No, it's radical. Well, it is indeed. But what are you waiting for? It's time for you to be radical. You see, some of you need to be radical in the way that you live because when we become radical followers of Christ, it doesn't stop at the baptistry. You see, it only begins there. We must live radically throughout our lives. Now, take our situation at hand. You see, so many folks claim the name of Jesus, claim that he is 
uh, their Savior and Lord, and that God is their Father who provides. He doesn't even allow a sparrow to fall to earth without his notice, right? That's what Jesus taught. But when it comes to the coronavirus and the potential uh, end of life and the sickness of this virus, well, we lose all sense of well-being. We live in fear and we live in, um, um, in, in a state of unrest. And, and our family sees how we're living. We, we, we make a confession. They, they know our confession, but what they see now that we are tested, we, we're just not radical. We, we, we speak the right words, but we're not living the right way. We, you need to be radical. It's time for us to live radically. I don't mean reckless. I mean radical. I mean all in with Jesus. To say, Lord, I'm giving you my fears. I'm giving you my worries. And with this uh, fledgling economy, it doesn't matter, God, because my hope is in you. Some of you need to be radical witnesses. Some, I, I'm absolutely certain that some of you haven't witnessed to another in maybe months, maybe even years. Now, if we're followers of Jesus, disciples that he calls on this journey of faith to bear our cross and follow him, if we are radical followers, how can we not witness? Now, I appreciate the fact that so many here invite others to church. Thank God. It's so crucial. But we must not stop there. We must offer words of hope and comfort we need to express these great sacred words of salvation to those who are desperately in need of the Lord's salvation. You see, it's time for us to be desperate. And there's not a better time for that than right now. You're talking about a contrast in light of where we are in our world and in our culture. I mean, there is never a, a, a better clear demonstration of real true faith, radical faith, than we can do right now. So let's do it. Join me. Come on. Let's be radical followers of Jesus. Let's be all in. Let's give all of ourselves to him. And let's trust and see what he does. Because radical needs brings incredible radical results to the people of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would take the truths of these passages, O oh God, and, and Lord, just uh, bring them to life in our lives. And I trust, God, that each worshiper and each Bible student and each worshiper today would not be a hearer only but be a doer of the word. Oh, God, we need to be radical. We need to be radical. Oh, Lord Jesus, call us to this radical life. Indeed, you have. Now may we have enough courage and faith to follow. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, and it is difficult times, and I certainly confess that in my own life and the lives of others, but, oh, Lord, you are more than sufficient, and we desire to follow you. Take us now. Take us now as your followers. And may the world be different because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let me say that you may be here this morning and you're not sure that you are uh, a radical follower. Maybe you're uh, of the opinion that you may be. Perhaps you are, but you're not certain you are a radical follower. Here's what you must do. Turn away from your sin and give the Lord Jesus your life. Just follow. I mean, surrender it all. The word in the Bible is Lord, and that is his title. That's who he is. And we must submit ourselves to him as our Lord. And if you're willing to do that, just cry out and call right now his name. Say something like, oh, Lord Jesus, I need your salvation. Forgive me, forgive me. Come into my life. Give me this gift of mercy and righteousness that comes only from Jesus. I need a new life, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Save me, Jesus. Save me. 
Now, if you're willing to pray that prayer or if you just did, then I want you to phone the church office or send me an email, and we would love to respond to you. Our God is good and he's faithful. He blesses those who obey his word. So make certain that you are a doer of the word today. We love you here at Liberty. God bless you. And we just trust that you're experiencing his greatness, his goodness, his mercy, his righteousness, and all his favor, even and even most particularly because of our situation. We love you. God bless you. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. This sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of the past are broken at last. I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. You got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How good I want more. for worshiping with us today. It's been a blessing to share the word of the Lord with you and for us to encounter the Lord together. Even though we're in a non-traditional setting, our Lord is good and he's faithful and I trust that he is pleased. Now, we will be worshiping each Sunday morning at 1045, just as we did this morning. And uh, you can access this as you did today, again, uh, on our Facebook page and also on YouTube. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, you can express those and we'll do our very best to reply quickly to any questions that you might have. Uh, also, we have a midweek Bible study that will be available to you every Wednesday at 630. It too will be available through Facebook and in YouTube. So we would invite you uh, to join us in the study of God's Word on Wednesday evening at 6.30. Also, um, I would like to mention that if you live in the area of Fayetteville, Georgia, and have a non-medical need that we can assist you with, please let us know. You can call the church office uh, or email me, and we have a team of members that are ready and prepared to respond. Now, the offering is... Uh, still in great need, but 
the way in which we provide our offerings, of course, like everything else, has changed. So on the Facebook page and YouTube, there is a link. And if you click the link, that will take you to our web page, and you can give online. And if it would be greatly appreciated, so greatly appreciated. And we certainly would honor our Lord in doing so. If you prefer traditional mail, of course, we would greatly appreciate your offerings and that means as well. Now, we love you and we thank the Lord for you. What a blessing it was today to share God's word with you yet again. We wish you the best. We're praying for you and crying out to God on your behalf. And we give the Lord thanks, our comforter, our help, our radical Savior in time of radical needs. Now, at this time, I ask Brother George Smith, the chairman of our deacons, to come and lead us in our closing prayer. God bless you, and we love you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us with yet another opportunity to come together and worship you. We thank you for your word that you've given us this day. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who came into this world as a man, who hung on the tree, died, buried, and was raised again. Oh, Heavenly Father, that fact is, a, uh, is evidence of your faithfulness. And we just want to thank you, O oh, Heavenly Father, for being so faithful to us. And we want to pray, O oh God, that you will be with those who are suffering from the uh, pandemic that we're experiencing in this world. We pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, for your mercy and your grace. We pray for healing mercies. We pray that you will give all of the uh, scientists and the doctors and nurses and caregivers uh, a feeling or an act or a, a, of compassion and mercy. And right now we pray, Lord, that you'll be with your children as we prepare to leave this place, that we'll feel your presence as we go out into the world. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord.